All right, so um, let's see how I'm going to do this. Let's talk about the race first. You have, let's say you have three people, A, B, C, D, and E, right? Those are the people that are in the race. They're going to finish the race. There will be awards for the top three, first place, second place, third place. So what I really wanted to see here, number one, are you, were you going to work together? Were you actually going to talk to each other? Or just sit there and, okay? And then the next thing was, you know, would you be able to come up with, with an attack and approach to this problem? And I heard different things, some, some ways that are more efficient than other ways. So let's just go with the most basic way you could approach this. You could just start listing out all the possible outcomes. You could say, all right, I could have, you know, first place A, second place B, then C. I could have A, B, and then what? D. I could have A, B, and then E. And that would be what? Three cases. And then you could go on and say, all right, what about if B got first place, right? Or you could keep, keep A here and what? Do C, B? Change the order in which second and third place come in. How about change these to D, B? Last one. E. Uh, yeah, did I get them? So there's six possibilities there. Do you all agree with this? Mm -hmm. But that's just with A being in first place. That's every other possible combination you can get with the others. Understand? So now you do, do B in first place and then all the different things, and then C in first place, and then D in first place, and then E in first place. And that would be tedious, right? Especially if this was uh, maybe 20 people in a race, and they gave awards first through fifth place, right? It could become more challenging. So there's probably a more efficient way, and that's to look at the number of ways the outcome occur, can occur. So if you have three slots, one, two, three, how many different ways can first place be awarded? Five different ways, right? Once that is awarded, there are only four people left that can get second place. So there are four ways that this could happen, and there are three ways that this could happen. Understand? And if you take the product of these numbers, you get the total number of possible ways. So it would be what? Five times four times three, which would be 60. There are 60 possible ways you could rearrange these letters in the first, second, and third place. Okay? Now, the next question had to do with a slightly different problem where you have a combination lock that has a little dial on it that you, you rotate. We've all seen combination locks before. Usually it's the digits 0 through 9, right? And this one, the particular digits are 1 through 26. And so the, the question is the number of ways that you can set that combination. How many different ways can it be done? So let's use the same principle. I mean, you wouldn't want to list them out, right? 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 2. Right, you wouldn't want to do that. But if you look at it with the same approach we just had, how many different ways can that first one be set? 26. How many different ways can this one be set? 26 again and then 26. And the reason why these all stay 26 is because the value of the first dial does not impact the value of the next one, right? You could have 999. That could be one of the settings. So what's 26 cubed? 17,576. So there are 17,576 or 26? 76. Okay. That's how many different ways you can set that combination lock. Now, the reason why I gave you these particular problems is because I want, I want to show you a video. And the, the, really, the, the main point of this video is just try and see if this sort of stuff even interests you. Like the video I show you, you might find, like, oh, wow, that's cool. Or you might just be, like, falling asleep, whatever. We'll see. How many of you are engineering majors? You know, mechanical, electrical, engineering, yes? Okay, um, computer science? Um, biology, biochemistry. Okay, so let me let me refer to first to the uh, the uh, all 
All right, so for those of you who've watched the video, um, the orientation for this class, you are aware that I actually keep um, copies of the lecture notes online in your course files, and I invite you to print those out. I actually printed out enough for the first day just to get us through, but from here on out, I would assume that you could get to them. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, well, actually, there's another version of this. These are the course lecture notes, and I'll be going through these in class like this. I'll be projecting them up there, but these, these notes will not appear in the video. Okay, so all it's going to be is what, what I'm doing up here on this board. So um, I would expect that you would follow along with me. So if you want to use a laptop or a tablet or something in here, you can. If not, old-fashioned way, just print it out and bring it to class. So please take, take one of these and pass, just kind of pass them out this way. Let's see if that's, that's enough. That if you have extra, just kind of let them flow this way. I hope that everyone had an opportunity to meet some of your classmates. And maybe y'all can get together and and uh, okay, thank you. And um, study, right? Sounds like fun. So let's talk about calculus one what it's about. I'm not going to get into these notes yet because this is, we're going to start out kind of with a review. See a lot of you, you know, we've seen this before. Let's just see what we're getting ourselves into. And I'm not even going to label this calculus one. I'm just going to talk about calculus in general. All right, what's calculus about? So up to this point, algebra, pre-cal, Right, trig, um, geometry, all of the courses that you've taken up to this point have always involved what are called finite processes. You know, everything has always been, you know, do this, 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 stop, answer, box it up. Everything's been finite, hasn't it? You know, like you do a set of operations and it's, it's done. So this is all about finite processes. An example of this would be just solving something like x squared minus 4x equals 0. So you have a quadratic equation there, and it's a finite process, right? You, you factor the left side. In this case, you could factor an x out. And then you set each factor equal to zero, you get two solutions, right? Zero and four. Everyone agree? And we're done. Process is over. It's finite. Calculus is about infinite processes. Okay, so calculus. These markers are terrible. They're like, we're going to go with this new brand, and they last for about three seconds. Um, infinite processes. Now we'll get into this. I'm going to show you some examples and just kind of get your brain thinking this way. But I was thinking about it. I was like, well, wait a minute. I'm just all of a sudden going to walk in and be like, let's talk about infinite processes when we really have not up to this point really discussed what infinity even is. Like, what is infinity, right? You've heard it, you've, you know what its symbol is, right? But let's discuss infinity a little bit. We've all seen this before. This is the symbol for infinity. It looks like an eight that's laying down, right? I've heard it called, like, if, like real math dorks will call it lazy eight. A lazy eight, right, sleeping. That's the infinity symbol. But what is infinity? Like, what is it? Is, is it a number? No? It's not? It's not the biggest number? So it doesn't, so it's not a number. Is that, are y'all saying, y'all agree with that? It could not be, this infinity could not be the biggest number because there is no biggest number, right? Think about it. If you think there's a biggest number, right? 
then you're saying it stops. And I can always add one to that and I'd be bigger, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no way you could ever come to a final number. So this idea of infinity is not saying that infinity is a number. It's an idea, right? It's a concept. It's the idea of continuing to grow. I mean, there's so many different ways to perceive it. But it, the main thing for you is to understand that infinity is not a number. It's an idea. It's a concept. So infinity is not a number. It is an idea, a concept. And it's going to be very important in this class for you to really be able to understand the way that things that are becoming <coughs> infinite behave. All right? How are they, how are they behaving? So let's talk about it. Let's, let's see. Um, what do you think would happen if I just write this down? So I'm asking you as a question here to just consider me writing this symbol down and tell me what you think. What do you think infinity plus 10 is? And, and I know you might say, wait a minute, you just told me infinity is not a number. So how are you going to add something that's not a number to a number? That's not what I want you to do. I want you to think about what this is saying. What is this, what is this equal to? Is it equal to something? What is the idea here of infinity? Something that's growing without bound, right? Just continuing to grow. If you add 10 to that, what do you get? Another, Another basically the same thing, right? It's something that's growing without bound. It's 10 bigger, but does 10 bigger really matter? when you're talking about something that's growing without bound? Yes. No. So the answer to this is infinity. So infinity plus infinity, or plus 10 is still infinity. That makes perfect sense for us in math to write that down. Also, we could have something like this. Infinity minus 10. What's that going to be? Infinity. infinity still, right? Taking 10 away from something that's growing arbitrarily large does not change the fact that it is still growing and it's becoming arbitrarily large. How about if I do infinity plus infinity? Two infinities? Well, it's still infinite, right? I mean, the idea is that big number plus, I mean, not big number. Growing number plus growing numbers should be a growing number, but I can represent a growing number with infinity still. So infinity plus infinity is still infinite. This, does this all kind of make sense? Okay. How about this? How about negative 1 times infinity? Negative infinity. Negative infinity? So is there a negative infinity? So what, what's the difference between, this is what, what I'm being told here, Jose, right? Is yes. saying that this is looking like that might be the case. Yeah. Infinity is something that's growing arbitrarily large. And we kind of assumed we meant positive numbers there, right? But you can go the other direction in the, on the x-axis and look at negative. So if you just take a huge, huge positive number, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you scale it by negative 1, all you're doing is changing it to a negative number now. So you should get something that's infinite but negative, and that's the way we write it, negative infinity. So that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. Where might we run into some issues, though? Positive infinity plus negative infinity. Positive infinity plus negative infinity. Or maybe, why don't I write it this way? So what, what does your instinct tell you that this is? Zero. You want to say zero because you've always said anything minus itself is zero, right? Like 10 minus 10 is zero, right? X minus X is zero. That's the same thing. It's, it's an infinity symbol minus infinity symbol. So you're thinking, yeah, it's zero. That's not the case. Because the concept of infinity just means that this is growing without bound. Does that necessarily mean that this expression is also growing without bound at the same rate? No. This one may be growing very slowly. 
this one may be growing very quickly, in which case this term might dominate this term and it actually does wind up being negative. You could have it the other way where this one's growing very rapidly and this one's just very slowly growing. What do I mean by slowly and, and quickly? I mean, think about something like this. If I did x to the fifth power minus x to the first power, just x. If I told you to plug in a number here, like let's say 1, you would get what? x to the fourth. If I say plug in 1 for x, what would you get? Yeah. Right? If I plug in 1, 1 to the fifth minus 1, you'd get 0. And in that case, yes, it would be 0. But what if I plug in something else, like 2? 2 to the fifth minus 2. That's going to be a pretty big number, right? What if I plug in 3? 3 to the fifth minus 3. That's going to be even bigger, isn't it? So if I let this x, right, if I let that x in there, if I let the x get big, go to infinity, right, so this arrow means I'm letting x approach infinity or get larger. If I allow that to happen, then this term becomes infinite, doesn't it? And this term becomes infinite also. But this one is getting bigger so much faster that this one is almost insignificant here, isn't it? This is a fifth degree polynomial, and you're subtracting a linear expression. This number is always going to be small compared to that. So understand this term will dominate. And so that answer in this case looks like it would be positive infinity. But if I flip it and I put the 5 here and I make it this way, what's going to happen? Now it's going to want to become negative infinity. So anytime we see something like this, we actually don't know what's going to happen until we actually investigate the expression more deeply. We have to know this before we can answer something like this. These here, there's no question. Something gets big, you add 10, it's still going to be big. What's another issue we could run into that we, we might run into here? Set numbers instead of growing. Are you saying it could be a set number? Like, explain. Like you say, it could be growing mm -hmm. like to the fifth or sixth. But what if it's just an actual number, like an actual variable to represent this an actual number? And you could already have a definite answer. In that case, you're saying that we're not allowing it to change. Yeah. Okay, we could do that, and that's probably more like what we did in college algebra and pre -cal. We always like had finite values for everything, didn't we? We never really let things become infinite or say, hey, let that grow and just keep growing and then ask what happens, right? Now we're going to do that, but before we can, we have to really kind of get our head around the idea of letting something get really big. Um, let's do something with the power. We haven't done that yet. What if I tell you I've got something that's really big, right? That means something that's getting really big, and I want to raise it to a power that's really big. What do you think is going to happen there? It's going to be big? How big? It's going to be infinite, isn't it? And it's still infinity. Infinity raised to infinity is still infinite. All right? It's still an infinitely large positive number in this case. Make sense or not? Yes? OK, let's try something else. Um, so there was not an issue with this one. This green one there was. How about this one? I haven't done this yet. What's that? We don't know. We don't know. Why well, have explain why we don't know? I mean like since the same thing is the same thing, right? It's kind of like this one, right? You kind of like have to know the rate at which they're growing. Because if these are growing, these might be growing at a rate that's actually somehow proportional, in which case the ratio of the two might be constant. And so you actually might be able to get a fixed number there. Or the top could grow so much faster than the bottom that the top gets bigger faster than the bottom one does. In that case, what happens? Or you might have a situation where the bottom gets bigger faster than the, the top does. And we're going to be investigating all of these different scenarios as the semester goes on in more detail. But I just wanted you to start to think about the idea of things growing without bound and how you can arrange them in ways that you kind of don't know what's happening. So the green one's question marks. It will all depend. Okay, let me throw another concept in here. What about something like this?
1 is a number, right? A fixed number. 1 divided by a number that gets arbitrarily large. So they get closer to zero. Gets smaller, 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 smaller. Doesn't it? Now, does it ever actually reach zero? No. No, because if I let like 1 over 1, then let me let the bottom get bigger. 1 over 10, and then 1 over 100, and then 1 over 1,000. I'm just picking some values here. 1 over 10,000. If I just keep doing that, these are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? But never reaching zero. But in the calculus perspective, since infinity was, wasn't even a number, I can actually write down something like this to make sense. But what we like to do instead is use like an arrow or something to say that, you know, we're not saying 1 over infinity even means anything. What we're saying is that 1 over infinity tends towards 0. So the arrow, arrow is telling you this is where that thing is heading. It's heading towards 0. Understand? Will that have worked with any number? up there. Did I have to use 1? No. Could I have used 10? Yeah. Okay. I could have used e. I could have used pi. Could I have used negative 1? Mm -hmm. Would that have changed the answer? Think about that. <coughs> Is it, it, would this still be going to 0? Yes. What would be the difference though? That's right. These would all, Every single one of these numbers, right, would be positive numbers getting closer to zero. These would all be negative numbers, but still getting closer to zero. So they both go to the same place, but the way they get there is a little different. All right. <clears throat> While we're talking about weird situations in infinity, I just want to throw something else in there for you. How about this expression? You ever have we ever dealt with that before? Have you ever seen that before in, in college algebra or pre -cal? Did you ever run into a situation where you had zero on top and bottom? What's that? Error. 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 Yeah. Normally it's an error, right? Because you get you get division by zero, which is not allowed, right? In, in college algebra, you, you may remember rational functions. And when you had a rational function, those are those ones that had like vertical asymptotes and and they had like horizontal asymptotes, and they looked like this, and then maybe it did something like this. And remember these things? Mm -hmm. And slant asymptotes. And, but sometimes they had holes. And those holes always took place wherever you had a, a, a number that you plug into the top and bottom and get zero and the top and bottom at the same time. We call those holes. And your function's not undefined. I mean, it's, your function is undefined at that hole, so you have to take that out. But we start in this class to really focus more on this, like what in the world is going on here? Is there a way that we can work around that? Can we actually get around the problem of zero divided by zero? And we'll have a way. You know, that's, what, that's a lot of what calculus is about, is trying to, to handle that problem. All right, infinity, let me see if there's anything else. Um, All right, this one might seem obvious. I'm not trying to trick you. What if you have something like this? Um, top's getting real big. Bottom staying the same. What happens here? It just becomes infinite, right? That's the same as saying what's infinity divided by 3. Still infinite, right? So infinity. You, are you kind of getting a general idea of what this concept of infinity is and how you have to be careful with the way you position things and you can't just say things like infinity minus infinity is zero? Yeah? All right. Now, this is bonus coverage. This is not necessarily something that we'll talk about in this class. But there are two types of infinity. This is just for fun. Okay? Two types of infinity. There's what's called countable. And then there's called uncount. An example of countable infinite, countably infinite, would be something like the set of numbers 
one, two, three, forever. Okay, so the, bra the braces mean a set of numbers starting at one and going on forever. The dots mean just continue that forever. So if you just start counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that is an infinite number, right? An infinite list, right? That list is infinitely long. But it's countable, meaning you can actually go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and start to kind of walk your way across that set of numbers, can't you? You never get to the other side, but you can walk your way across. There's actually a way that you can do it um, with all fractions, what are called rational numbers. So believe it or not, there is a way to walk your way through the fractions. Start, let's say start at zero and start walking your way through the fractions down the number line. Now we know there's an infinite number of fractions, don't we? But there is a way to walk through them and of course you don't ever get to the other end, but there's a way you can walk without accidentally stepping over one. It's, it's tricky to show that. But all those fall into the uncountable, I mean the countable sets of infinity. So there's some way to actually go through them. One of the best analogies I ever heard was um, thinking about it as like lily pads on a pond. Countably infinite means there's a way to actually walk across this pond. The, the pond never ends, but there's a way you can walk across the lily pads and go across. Uncountably infinite means that it's impossible to work your way through the numbers. You cannot walk on a lily pad and step to the next one. And here's a good example. If you just take the interval 0, 1, just all the numbers between 0 and 1, there is an uncountable infinite number of numbers in here. It's uncountable. So you cannot, you cannot say, I'm going to start at 0 and then go to the next number. If you try and say what the next number is, you actually miss a bunch in here. In fact, you actually miss an infinite number of numbers as soon as you take that first step on the lily pad. And so you look over and you say, oh, shit, I missed an infinite number of numbers. And then you realize it's an uncountable number of numbers that you missed. And so you try and go back, and then you realize you missed another infinite number. And it's just impossible. So believe it or not, I mean, I know that there are a few people here that were math majors. The idea of countably infinite and uncountable are, are major ideas in that, the two concepts. In Cal 1, this is all we need to know. Infinity growing without bounds. You don't need to know the countable on countable part. All right. I think that's probably enough kind of set up as far as the infinity is concerned. Now let's actually talk about some of the like real things we're going to do in here. I only have what? Jeez, how did all my time go? I showed all these videos. Um, so what do we do in calculus one? Well, what, one of the main ideas, and I'm going to try and stay as geometric as possible here, is that we take, we take a function, and you know, it can be anything, doesn't matter what it is. We take a function, that could be a polynomial function, it could be a rational function, it could be a sine curve, right? It can be anything, trig functions, everything is fair game. Someone was asking me, you know, what's the difference between uh, calculus one and business calculus? The difference is, well, there's a lot of differences, but one of the main ones is that in business calculus, they do not touch trig functions. So they do not mess with sine, cosine, tangent, they don't, they don't do it. We, we have that in our toolbox. That's why we took free power. So let's just say we have a function, and I want to take a point on that function, and let's say I'll take another point on that function. I'll call this point A and this point B. And I want to connect these two with a straight line. And I'm going to call that the secant line. That, that word comes from, if you have a circle, and you take two points on a circle and connect them like that, we call that the secant line. Same sort of principle, except that these two points don't live on a circle. They live on a curve. And that curve can be anything. So we call it the secant line connecting those two points. So to define a secant line, we need two points, don't we? Now on a circle, what was a tangent line on a circle? 
touches the outside. It touches the outside, right? At just one point. And just comes in and just touches there. And it turns out that on a circle, if we ran the radius out to that point, this would be a right angle, wouldn't it? That's what a tangent line is in, on a circle. Do you think we can have the same concept here on this function? Do you think if I went to this point right here that I could somehow define a tangent line? That means a line that just touches the curve, just touches at one point. Yeah? yeah. It might be easier if you take, take a curve that looks like this. Right? And in that case, can you see that you could somehow come up with a tangent line across this top like that? It would just touch the top of it. You see that? And that's something that we are going to be going after in this class. It's, it's one of the major results, is can you find the slope of this line? If someone gives you a point on the curve, so they just tell you, okay, ready, right, there. Go up to the curve, tell me the slope of the line that cuts through that point. Now, why would this become important to us? Why is that valuable? Let's see. Does everyone understand geometrically what we'll be trying to do? Okay. So why would that be important to us? Um, go to another graph here. It's always good to, to use uh, time and distance as our x and y axis when we're trying to get some sort of visual I idea geometric idea of what's going on here. Um, I'm going to draw a curve here, like this. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to say this is two hours. And over here, I'm going to say this is uh, 60 miles. So this curve tells you exactly where you were at every point in time, doesn't it? At time is zero, where were you? Zero distance from wherever you're starting. So that's you just waiting to start, whatever, whatever. probably on a bike or a motorcycle or something, okay? And then, how far have you gone after two hours? 60 miles. You've gone 60 miles. Yes? You've gone 60 miles in two hours. If we connect these two points together, we get a secant line, don't we? What is the slope of this secant line? M is what we used for slope in college algebra. I'll put M with SEC next to it to mean secant. What is the slope of that line? 30. How are you getting 30? Rise over run, right? Rise is 60. Run is 2. 60 divided by 2 is 30. And let's use the units in here. Your rise is actually measured in what? Miles, distance. And then per and then the time was measured in hours. So the ratio, right, the ratio that represents the slope of this line is actually a speed, isn't it, miles per hour? 30 miles per hour is what? Your, your what? Is it your speed? What is it? It's your average speed. If you go 60 miles in two hours, that means that you went 30 miles per hour. Yes? But that's, that's really, a, it's a good quantity to know, but we know that if you get on a motorcycle or, or get in your car and you drive and you go 60 miles in two hours, we know that you were not <clears throat> going 30 miles an hour the whole time, right? You slow down, you speed up. You actually have to accelerate from zero to some speed. So your average speed is what you would have had to travel at every moment in time without acceleration, if that makes sense. So it's a good quantity, but it's not that great. What would be more, more interesting is to actually know at, let's say, exactly half an hour to, is that me? No, okay. To, to actually know at half an hour what your speed was. Right? Exactly at half an hour, you look down at your speedometer, and you can read it off your speedometer, right? But geometrically, what that would mean is that you need to find the slope of that tangent line. You need to actually figure out what that slope is. I'm telling you that that's what calculus is about. It's about being able to find something like that. What is inherent, inherently wrong, though? What is the problem we're going to run into, though, if we try and find the slope of that line? I'm going to put M tan. The slope, we said, was rise over run, right? That's how we got the 30. Right? 
What's wrong if I'm trying to find the slope of a line at a single point? At a single point, you don't have rise over run, do you? You need two points. You need two points to define a line, don't you? And that's the problem that calculus is trying to get around, is that it makes sense that we should have a speed at that instant time, doesn't it? Makes sense that we should, mm -hmm. but our definition of speed requires two points, or does it? We need rise over run. So if you are at one point, have you risen at all? So that's like zero rise, and then how much have you gone left and right at a single point? Zero. Zero. And what I'm telling you is that this is what Isaac Newton and Leibniz, the fathers of calculus, were able to get around. They were able to figure out that that does do something. It does head to something, a number, and that number will be the slope of that line. But it's how do we get to it? How do we handle it? In college algebra, what we did is we just said, mm -hmm, no, we're not touching it. Division by zero, we're not touching it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to allow ourselves to actually pick another point. We can define that slope, can't we, between those two? Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move the point closer. And we can define the slope between that two, right? And then we're going to move that point even closer, and closer, and closer, and closer, and closer, and closer. How close? Infinitely close. I'm going to have a second point, but I'm going to let it get arbitrarily small, which is like the opposite of letting something become arbitrarily big. So in, in some ways, we're using infinity. We're approaching, we're smashing that point down, two points down into a single point by using an infinite number of steps to get to it, if that makes sense. And we'll find that it will yield us an answer a lot of the times. It will yield a number for us. OK, so what are we doing for next class? Because today was all just about, hi, nice to meet you, all that good stuff. we got to get down to business, though. we got to start getting into the math. Um, here's what I want you to do for home for next time. On Canvas, you should do the, the quiz. It's the quiz on the syllabus. If you already did it, don't worry about it. All right, that just says, I've read the syllabus. I understand the requirements of the course. Um, the other thing is to watch the course video for this is 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, Sorry, 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, so on our on our Canvas page, there's a thing called there's things called course videos. Not class videos, course videos. Those I made a couple of semesters ago, and those videos are basically me going through these notes and explaining things, definitions. Some of them are short, some of them are long. Um, and just that way, when I get to class, I don't have to really spend a whole lot of time going through all this, and I can just try and do examples. So that's what I'm going to want you to do for next time. Anything else? I don't think so. Make sure you turn in the quiz. I will give those back to you, because I know you wrote, you wrote down some people's names and stuff. But please just bring those quizzes up to this corner. That's how I'll take attendance today based on that quiz.